Ohio State football with a busy week of off-the-field news as coaching changes continue. A couple of players decide that they're going to come back for the 2022 season. One of them, I think, was maybe a bit more unexpected than the other. There is still plenty going on with the Ohio State football team, despite the fact we are early on in the offseason. We've got plenty to share with you. It's Buckeye Breakdown, talking coaching changes and players coming back. And uh, Buckeye's now on Sports Illustrated. We've got the whole crew together as we cover Ohio State with our instant analysis from Ohio State. There's something that doesn't feel right. Unbelievable effort from him today. Is EJ Liddell going to crack the first team all Big Ten? I think he can be the guy. I'm not trying to start a quarterback controversy. He seems to have the durability. He certainly has the toughness. This is the question on a lot of people's minds here. Welcome to Buckeye Breakdown. Well, good afternoon and welcome back to Buckeye Breakdown. Alongside our coach, Tommy Zagorski, I'm Brendan Gulick. Before we get rolling, coach, what's going on? It's been a little while. Hey, living the dream. Be safe out there. You know, a little bit of a winter wonderland here for those, our friends in the in the blistery Northeast. It's been a lot of fun and, uh, you know, a lot of great opportunities to, uh, to enjoy really the four seasons. It's something I always talk to people about <laughs> when I recruited them outside to bring them to Ohio. You know, for whatever area they were, they go, what can you tell me about Ohio that's not like anything else in the world? You really get all four seasons. We get a summer. We get a true fall that is absolutely breathtaking. I'll call it autumn because it just sounds that much better. A true winter where you get to shovel snow and I, and it, it's not you don't have to. You get to, guys. Let's enjoy that. <laughs> and then you have an un- unbelievable spring as well. And uh, and you really get to celebrate all four seasons. So uh, all different types of coats, pants, <laughs> shoes. Uh, your your wardrobe is out absolutely uh, a great thing you could build on. So I, I always love that, and uh, we're in the thick of it right now. So when you think, oh, this snow, yeah, not everybody else gets to have the opportunity to celebrate it. So let's enjoy it. Let's Sometimes you get all all four seasons in the same day or or in a forty eight hour period. <laughs> No uh, doubt. I, we, I think someone uh, said in one day for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, here in in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I'm in Strongsville, and we got sixteen inches. Uh, I know there were places like out east of Cleveland that got upwards of 20 plus. So it, uh, uh, I would imagine the snow is going to be around here for a little while, but that's okay. That's uh, that's part of the deal. Hey, um, plenty going on down at Columbus. That's for darn sure. Um, we've got new coaches on staff. We've talked about a couple of them, but in the last week, we've got another addition. Matt Guerreri is coming from Duke to Columbus. Uh, Tony Alford has received a promotion to run game coordinator. Boy, Tony's done an unbelievable job with the running backs uh, over the last five or six years now. He's basically had a 1,000-yard a rusher every year with the exception of the COVID you know, shortened season. Um, you've got a, a, a couple guys returning, and, and uh, we've got a landing spot for a couple of coaches uh, that have left. So plenty of news to dive into. Why don't we start with what's going on with, with the guys that are in Columbus? And so maybe we start with Tony Alford. Um, you could argue that maybe over the last six years, the the consistent star power in that room is perhaps better than any other room. Thinking about Ezekiel Elliott and, and what J.K. Dobbins has done, what Travion Henderson has done, Mike Weber had a great season in, uh, in the year that he ran for 1,000 yards. I mean, if anybody on this staff has earned a promotion, it's it's certainly Tony. Yeah, you know, for Ryan Day, where do you go with Tony Alford? He's had an incredible run of great running backs, you know, really his entire time here in Columbus. And and one of the things is you're recruiting to the point where you should have the best players in the country week in and week out, year in and year out. And Tony's done it. He's delivered. He's delivered on guys in his room. He's helped, you know, close the deal on other guys in in that program. And I think Ryan Day's out of assistant and associate head coaching titles. At one point last year, it looked like half the staff had those. So how do you give Tony a great raise? Because, you know, really that's what he deserves. Tony's been a guy that's been rumored for every coaching job in America. I still think that our friends out in Fort Collins missed the boat. You know, he's a great Colorado State graduate. And I really think before they went getting a dude from Boston College, he would have been the great hire for to give that stability at Colorado State. They've got facilities, the location's outstanding. People love to get there. And, and Tony's an alum. Tony's been a great guy for the hire. And, and they passed him on the first time. I think this last time around, they definitely went after him. A couple other people have gone after him. Uh, he's been loyal to the Buckeyes. And Ryan Day knows that's a valuable guy on his staff. He's got to continue 
to, to promote from within. And when I say promote within is you give those little titles to guys. And when you give those titles, it means a lot to you as a coach. And, and I know, I know we as coaches, when you get into different situations, when I first got to Eastern Kentucky, I was a tight end coach. And in my three year span there, I think I had every title except for the head coach by the time I left. And one of the things that was really unique about that was the growth that I was able to have as a coach. And my head coach said, hey, you deserve this, this, and this. So Tony's got to be really excited about it, well-deserved for him, uh, and the development that he's done in that room uh, for the running backs. Well, and even just from a stability perspective, right? I mean, it, it, it really helps when you've got a group of young guys in a room, like, you know, Master Teague's gone, right? And, and this offense – you know, CJ Stroud's going to get a lot of the headlines. Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to get a ton of attention. And rightly so, there's a lot of people that believe that Travion Henderson going into next season could be the top running back in the country. If he's not the top back, he is certainly in the conversation, uh, you know, to, to be the top running back in America. He, he had an unbelievable freshman season, you know, broke Ohio State's freshman single season touchdown record. Um, Evan Pryor didn't see a ton of carries this year, but he was pretty highly recruited out of high school. You'd like to see him continue to develop uh, and, and to just have have the same voice in that room time and time again. Those guys, I'm sure, partly made the decision to come to Ohio State because of the guys that had come before them, right? If you have dreams of playing in the NFL and you're going to go play big-time college football, you want to work with a coach who has mentored guys that have gone on to play in the NFL – because you trust that that system works. And so I think this is further, you know, validation that what Tony Alford is doing in Columbus is working and it's it's working at a really high level. Absolutely. The other thing that a lot of coaches will do is wherever they go, the players also kind of quote unquote follow them. You know, Alvin Kamara's running back when he was at the University of Tennessee is a guy named Robert Gillespie. Robert Gillespie left the University of Tennessee to go coach at North Carolina. He goes and has two drafted running backs at UNC. Then with that goes to Alabama. So, you know, those guys go and visit, they stop in, they see these coaches. Players are not dumb. When they go through this recruiting process, they're going to ask you, what have you done for me? And it's the same thing. Any one of us go for an interview for a job. You know, it's great. You're going to be wearing different colors. You'll be working for a different organization, but at the same time, who have you developed? Like legitimately I've sat in interviews who can we call and say, you developed me. And kids want to hear that in recruiting as well. It's really important. Um, and, and they're going to continue to do that and keeping Tony Alford at home. That's an outstanding uh, job by Ryan Day, you know, pinpointing that and getting the opportunity to keep him home in Columbus. Speaking of, of running backs, um, certainly helps when you have offensive linemen that are pretty good to run behind. Uh, and while the Buckeyes are, are losing two offensive linemen to the draft this year, um, I was a bit surprised that Dewan Jones is choosing to come back to Columbus. I thought he might go pro. I think it's better for him that he's coming back, but I just kind of thought he might try to go pro this year. Um, you've got Paris Johnson, who's in all likelihood going to move from guard to tackle. So you've got two guys that are going to anchor the outside of your offensive line. You know, one will be changing positions, but maybe a bit more natural for Paris uh, to actually have two tackles on the line playing tackle instead of four offensive linemen that might be true tackles. Uh, and you've got your center coming back. So you're going to have to replace a couple starters, but it feels like you've got some really good working capital, if you will. Um, and guys like, geez, Donovan Jackson for sure, Matthew Jones. I mean, I would think they'd be candidates to to fill in on the interior of the line. Um, what kind of impact do you think – Dewan Jones can have on this line next year? Well, it's going to be all important what he's doing right now. This is the most important time of the year for him. He's got to be locked in on his diet. He's got to be locked in on what he's trying to do. And I think you're going to see him come back a leaner player. And, and there's no, no knock on him. He's a massive human being. And everyone's like, well, that's what linemen need to be. But, you know, John Madden, the late great John Madden, used to joke, it looks like he's carrying his lunch under over his belly. But we don't want linemen like that anymore. You want athletes. You want guys that look – like they're athletes, when they walk off the field, you go, wait a second, that guy's not a heavy cat. And I watched, you know, I watched him play basketball, Ben Davis, and he was a big guy, but his feet are so nimble. And, and when you see that, it gets you get excited about athletically. I say all this because he's basically going into his free agency year in the NFL. You see this with free agency guys all the time. 
They'll go vegan as an offensive lineman. They'll do different things that whatever they do diet-wise to try to get themselves the best opportunity to get that best contract. And that's a big part of why he's coming back. Not only unfinished business as a Buckeye, but another year of growth, another year of development, and another opportunity to sign a little bit better of a guaranteed contract when you get into the league. And, and, and as an offensive lineman, there's different guys. You're going to see Trey Smith play this weekend. Trey Smith got the ultimate snub through the draft. He starts a guard for the Chiefs right now. Trey played at Tennessee. And Trey's a guy that was, you know, one of the best linemen in the country when he came out, fought through injuries, did different things. But, you know, DeJuan could get somewhere and play right away in the NFL as an offensive lineman. But in his best interest, his family's best interest financially, come back another year. Let, let Mickey Mariotti, arguably, if not the best, one of the best in the business, Shape your body, mold your body, listen to him, be balanced. Don't drink cane sauce. Don't be running off to different places at, at midnight to go eat this and go eat that. Stay out of Buckeye Donuts. Like, do different things around campus that you don't need to be near. Like, yeah, I'm sure you can eat an entire Buckeye pizza uh, when you're there, but you don't need to do that from Adriatico's. But, and I'm, I feel like I'm giving sponsorships to Columbus places. <laughs> Hashtag but these are different places you can eat around campus. And I'm sure there's a multiple <laughs> other ones that, I, that I'm alluding right there that I'm leaving off the list. He's got to be disciplined. What does it mean to him? What does it mean to his family? What does it mean to have that opportunity? And I think if he can do that, um, you're talking about somebody that's going to have a, a remarkable uh, senior season and really give back to the Buckeyes. And I, I think that's what you're going to see out of him going forward. I, I don't want to get um, too far away from kind of what we uh, projected to, to talk about here, but I think you bring up a really interesting part with with uh, strength and conditioning here and, and Mickey Marotti. I mean, obviously, like, you know, winter workouts have started. This is a critical time for the development of the program. You've been around a lot of really good strength and conditioning staffs, and I know you've been around a couple that you you kind of pinpointed early on and said, hey, maybe this isn't the direction we need to be going. So you kind of have a feel for what works and what doesn't. When you see a strength and conditioning staff with the um, the laud and the praise that, that Ohio State has received – time and time again now for basically two decades. How much do you think they took it on the chin on November 27th when they felt like the Buckeyes were pushed around a little bit against Michigan? It's a big part of it. That's a long talk. That's Ryan Day's going to come in and say, wait a second, we train all offseason for this. We train for this. I mean, that's what. That's why you watch these strength coaches on, on, on Saturdays on, on TV. They're invested in this game just as much as anybody else. They spend more time with these kids than anybody. And if they're not establishing the culture for your program, you're in trouble. If your strength guy is not building that toughness, and I, I always use the term callousing your heart, callousing your mind, and callousing your hands. They have to do that every single day in the weight room. And when they do that, by the time you get them as a coach to actually do football, you know, interactions with them and skills and drills, it gives you the ability to know you can push this guy to a certain extent. And that's really what the weight room is. I mean, half these guys are psychology people. I mean, what they're going to do, they're going to push these players to a point. And trust me, this entire offseason, they're going to remind these players that the two times they lost this year, why? Because someone was more physical. Someone came in and punched them in the face. And how did they respond? They didn't respond the way they wanted them to. And that's going to be the battle cry going forward. Mickey Mariotti and his career, go back and look at this guy. He has not had a lot of those years where you walk off the field and go, Man, his guys are soft today. He takes a lot of pride in that, and he's going to continue to take a lot of pride in that, and he's going to use that as a chip on his shoulder to push these guys, which sometimes when they're that great, you know, how many chips do you really need? And I think going into this preseason, they're going to be number two in the country probably in 99.9% .9 of polls. You know, the, the defending national champion usually is always number one no matter what until they're unseated. But I think you're going to see this team, this is going to help them mature again, keep building building and really push themselves during this offseason, you know, in that room. And that's so important for these guys. And I, I think that's such a good conversation to have, especially with offensive linemen right now. Um, and again, I got, I don't want to knock Ohio state's offensive line from this past year. The numbers that the Buckeye offense put up were ridiculous. Ohio state's offense wasn't the problem. I don't want that to come across that, that I'm, that I'm saying that it certainly was not the issue. Um, but I look at what we saw on TV on January 10th or 11th. What was the national title game? Uh, I think it was the, the 10th. Um, you watch Georgia's defense, and for a good chunk of the game, Alabama's defense, but especially Georgia's defense, the guys that they had, I mean, were, were some of them, you know, maybe overweight a little bit? Yeah. But the, the combination 
of size and speed from the defensive linemen and then certainly from the linebackers. To me, that's what jumped off the page and said, like, okay, this is what a championship caliber defense looks like. And I just thought we saw far too few flashes of that uh, from Ohio State this year. Not not saying that it's not possible. Um, I thought Ohio State's interior defensive line play, other than Haskell Garrett, was okay. I didn't think they were nearly good enough on the defensive line this year compared to to their standards in the past. I know at, at defensive end, they they were not nearly what they've been. Um, you know, Zach Harrison and Tyreek Smith had a few good games here and there, but not nearly consistent enough. H- how much do you really expect from true freshmen and Jack Sawyer and JT Tuimolo out? I thought they played really well, but they also played like they were true freshmen. Uh, I can't wait to see what those guys do next year, especially JT. Um, he he has, to me, he has the best combination of, you know, of of physical tools to to make you think this guy could be the next great, and I mean great defensive end. Um, so I I just look in the trenches because you're right, especially in the Oregon game and in the Michigan game. You know, the, the Buckeyes got pushed around. You know, the Nebraska game and Minnesota games, Ohio State won those, but um, those were tough up front. And I, I I just, I think about guys like Dewan Jones choosing to come back as we sort of bring this full circle. Him choosing to come back, I think, is going to be good for his future and good for his overall development. But it's an area that the team, I think, really needs to spend a lot of time and effort on here in the offseason. Yeah, and a lot of the, and we talked about this multiple times throughout the season. You look at the Buckeyes, you look at where they're at. A lot of these players are young guys. They're young players. A lot of these players aren't guys that opted in for another year of eligibility. I mean, even when they played Utah, Utah's the amount of experience that was on that Utah team compared to Ohio State, vastly different. Michigan, I mean, Michigan had guys that have been there forever, still playing as Michigan Wolverine. Ohio State, Alabama, those are teams that, and you could argue, well, Alabama was the national championship and they did this and this. Alabama lost to Texas a and during the regular season. They ended up losing the national title game you know, relatively handily when it, when it all was said and done. But they lost those games because also their players, they don't have the same guys they traditionally have. One of the benefits, one of the negatives of recruiting so well is you're going to lose guys to a, either the portal or the National Football League. And it happens – to these great programs all the time. I mean, look at Ohio State. The wide receiver room was so stacked. I mean, like, James has to leave. I mean, like, you look at the, the value that they have with those upperclassmen. And then these defensive linemen are just going to get older uh, and better. And Zach Harrison, you think about it, Zach Harrison is still only 20 years old. Right. I know we look at him, we expect him to be, you know, the the Bosa, the, the, the young. We expect him to be on that level as a player. He's not there right now. And why is he not there? It's the development. He's 20 years old. He's a young player. He's not a 22-year-old, 50-year senior, you know, like we saw with Aiden Hutchinson. He's not this. And you can argue, you could say, hey, 55 for the for, for Michigan. He's another guy that was you know, played five years of high school, five years of football, period. You know, some people have it a little bit genetically better. But Harrison, I'm hoping really for him that he's going to be somebody that steps up this year. I'm hoping inside those defensive tackles are just going to continue to get better. I mean, Williams, I thought, had a – Started really strong Absolutely. throughout the year. I thought he played really well. I'm excited about him. You know, we're talking about, you know, Sawyer. We're talking about these guys going forward. I think there was a lot of upside there, and they're only going to get better as we, as we go forward with this. And now you add that with some of the some of the absolute werewolves we've had in the past at Ohio State. That's where that process, as those guys mature and come together, uh, it, it can be really, really exciting to watch this fall. One other guy that has chosen to come back that uh, made headlines yesterday is kicker Noah Ruggles. Um, I'm not sure Ohio State really could have, you know, gotten much better uh, out of Noah Ruggles. I mean, he was he was darn near perfect. Um, you know, as as a head coach, I would imagine that when you when you say, "Hey, it's time to kick a field goal," you're kind of banking on, "Hey, this is you know, we got three points out of this drive." before you get out there, right? You kind of expect that it's going to work. Um, and in this world of, you know, what have you done for me lately and and needing to continually prove yourself, I just thought Noah Ruggles, you know, I mean, geez, he probably single-handedly won a couple of games this year when he when he went on a field goal barrage. Uh, 
Nebraska being one of them. So, you know, have, having somebody that reliable, uh, I think that's a great thing for Ohio State next year to know that, you know, look, they're bringing a guy back that had one of the more uh, productive seasons across college football, no matter what level it was. And also, add to the equation, can he kick it through the end zone, please? You and I talked about this. Right. We, we watched, I mean, you and I both during the national championship game, you're texting me, you go, why are they kicking it through the end zone? I go, because they can. And I'm almost positive he can as well, right? I've seen him do it throughout the season. I'm still baffled. I didn't know what the weather was like that day in Pasadena, uh, why he was kicking. Two mile an hour wind at kickoff. Well, that two mile an hour wind came and it came and it <laughs> went. So, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully having the opportunity, you know, because that's really, even for him to come back, the biggest thing in the National Football League when they were looking at these kickers, they're going to look at power as well. You know, that's and, and that's some of these things, these guys got hammers for legs. I mean, you're watching, you know, these <laughs> folks you've been watching. You know, he's going to try a 58 yard field goal. And like, I mean, he's there on it. You know, that's, that's where it's remarkable to watch these guys kind of continue to grow and develop. So hopefully Noah, it's good to have him back. Uh, and like you said, as an offensive play caller, when you get into that red zone, you, you or even get into the 30, 40 range, you kind of go, all right, we got a field goal here. It, it forces you also to be a little bit, uh, it affords you to be a little bit more aggressive on a second and two call from the 36 yard line than you normally would be. So I, I think that's where, you know, that grows for them as, as, as an organization and hopefully it's going to help the Buckeyes this fall. Yeah. And Noah talked about how, you know, part of his success this year, he attributed to his, uh, his training regimen changing a little bit, basically saying, you know, I, before I came to Ohio state, I was sort of expected to, to be going max effort kicking every day. And he goes, I, you know, my body couldn't really handle that. I needed to dial it back a little bit. Um, uh, you know, results, it's, it's a results oriented business, right? He made darn near every kick. I think he missed one kick all season long, never missed an extra point. So, you know, um, uh, you're not going to get a whole lot of complaints out of that, especially with an offense that can score points at, at, uh, you know, the, the clip that Ohio state does. Um, all right. I want to mention, I did get a great comment here. Uh, I did not realize it was at sea level Pasadena. So, uh, because of that, with the physics, I, I'm all in, Jackie. If that's the case, that's good to know. I, honestly, God, I, I love hearing that. You know, I, I know yeah. I've been with teams in the mountains. I've been with teams in different areas. Uh, usually, when we got a guy that can kick it, he can kick it. So interesting to see that. It's a great point. So um, yeah, uh, Pasadena is is uh, yeah. I would say it's probably you know at most a uh, hundred feet above sea level or or so. Um, maybe maybe two hundred feet, but. Um, you know, the mountains are all around you, but the stadium's kind of down in the valley. And uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. Um, all right, let's let's swivel to the two coaches that left on the defensive side of the ball. And uh, well, well, let me rephrase that. There are three coaches that left on the defensive side of the ball. Matt Barnes, it was literally leaked the night of the Rose Bowl that he was going to Memphis to be their defensive coordinator. Uh, the two I'm referencing are, are Kerry Combs and Al Washington, who – uh, we weren't sure if they were going to be back. Thought there was a decent chance they would both be gone, but you never really know for sure. Um, Al Washington, uh, an opportunity with Notre Dame. We'll start there. Um, I, I think it's it's a fun storyline that you know Al is going to be on Notre Dame staff when they come back to Columbus. The next game Al coaches is going to be in Ohio Stadium, uh, just on the opposite sideline. You know, this is a guy that certainly has a great resume. Um, I thought Al Washington did a good job with the Buckeyes. I know other people uh, and, and some fans may disagree with that. I liked the job that he did. I thought we had a young linebacking core this year that went through some growing pains. Um, but I I thought we saw some really impressive growth. Cody Simon played really well uh, when he was healthy this year. Tommy Eichenberg played the game of his life in the Rose Bowl. You look at where Tommy was in week three to where he was at the end of the season – there was tremendous growth there from him. Steel Chambers had, I thought, a, a fabulous season. In fact, Taraja Mitchell, who everybody sort of expected would be the captain and the leader of the group, I thought he had a good impact. But to me, he wasn't the most notable impactful player in that group. You're going to insert Diamante Trainum next year, who is a wrecking ball. Uh, and, and I can't wait to see the transition that he makes from running back to linebacker. Uh, you know, an, an Akron Archbishop Hoban kid that is immediately going to be one of the strongest players on Ohio State's team. Um, I I thought the linebacking core was was better as the year went along, and and you know I thought Al did a good job in recruiting, so I, I certainly wish him well, and um, 
he's heading to South Bend. Yeah, great opportunity for he and his family. Uh, and, and I think with Al, one of the things you see is his pedigree. He's, he's climbed the ladder. He's a Columbus guy. He went to Bishop Waterson High School, Boston College. You know, and then had the ability when, you know, after Boston College to come back to Boston College. You know, as a coach, was at Cincinnati with Luke Fickle. So he and Marcus have, you know, crossover there. They've worked together before. And they know each other intimately in that circle. One of the things that's been really interesting about watching where these guys have gone when they're leaving Ohio State, to show you the quality of the coach, the, the, uh, the they haven't even removed their names from their offices yet at Ohio State, and they're already signing with some great programs. You know, and then be at Notre Dame, um, it's going to be an interesting, exciting time for him, you know, in South Bend. And, and I think that it'll be good to see him coaching defensive line again because I really think that's where his strength is. He's been kind of a better defensive line coach over the years. He's had the versatility to move back to linebacker and, and coach linebacker, you know, whatever's needed. Uh, but he, he's definitely a box coach, and it's going to be a, a good adjustment for him to go after those guys at Notre Dame. You probably see a little bit better of a defensive lineman candidate at Notre Dame as well. He'll understand how to recruit those guys. And with his background in Catholic education, uh, I think it, it adds to that. The reason that's important is when you're at the University of Notre Dame, you're not selling on facilities. No. You're not selling on location. You're selling on tradition. And, and you're selling on a different experience because the experience at Notre Dame is vastly different than almost anywhere else in the world. And I think that's where he's going to be able to hone in on that uh, and, and have the ability to really go gravitate towards the players that they're going to need uh, to go close on and go win on uh, to really grow that program. Can you give people an idea? You know, you, you, let, let me backtrack for a second here. So the idea of coaching a position group, right? Like if you were an offensive lineman as a player, I think fans think that you could coach offensive line, but like the thought of you coaching a different position other than the position that you played or you're intimately familiar with or somehow pigeonholed into, you know, it, it, sometimes people wonder like how that can actually happen. So when I think about Al Washington coaching linebackers at Ohio state, now moving to a defensive line, you know, responsibility at Notre Dame, just in, in the ideas in the, in the different position groups that you've coached, can you give people an idea at, at how coaches can be versatile and how certain skill sets can translate from coaching one group to another group? Yeah, I've always used the analogy of being like a chef. And you know, some people look at me like, a chef? Hold on, what are you talking about? A chef can cook. And when a chef can cook, he can, co he can cook a lot of different things. And I think that's the same thing that happens as a, as, a, as a coach. You are a person who has the ability to teach. You're a teacher at the beginning, at the end of the day. When you have a broad enough uh, understanding of the game, you understand enough about it, you have the ability then to teach those different things. So, for example, I know this. Like, I had a teacher that taught me algebra in high school. I had another different teacher for geometry. I don't think the algebra teacher couldn't teach geometry and vice versa. They were teachers, and, and they were teachers in the purest sense. Mr. D. Geronimo at Benedict in high school, you know, Mr. Reeves, both those guys were great teachers, and I knew when I went into their class, I was going to learn that subject because why? Because they took a lot of time. They took to prepare. They were disciplined in their approach to it. Al's done the same thing. I mean, think about this. Al Washington has been a defensive defensive line coach, a linebackers coach, and a running backs coach. A lot of people forget this. At Boston College, he coached the running backs for a year. And I know in my career, I've had many different hats and different titles that I've worn. When you're a coach, you can coach whatever it may be. And I think that's what you're seeing with Al. And then you add in the equation that he's a, he's a great recruiter. Now you piece those things together, you know, you know, from there. And there's going to be different things he's going to learn as he goes along. I know my first year of coaching tight ends, I coached tight ends at the Division One level. And, I'm, you know, I never run a route in my life. So guess what? What did I do? I met the best receiver coaches and tight end coaches I could find in America, met with those guys. And guess what? They taught me things that I wasn't able to do from that perspective. In the same way, I've had guys come to me and they were learning how to teach blocking and they would go, hey, I've never done this before. Like, how do you do that? You know, and go through it. So, you know, that's where Al's a great teacher, a great educator, and he's going to do a phenomenal job, um, you know, being able to coach at defensive line. I think when you look at it, that's one of the things he gets excited as a head coach is being able to move guys around because of their versatility. When you have a guy on your staff that you can move versatility wise, it kind of opens things up for you. Uh, and that's where really, wherever it may be uh, and whatever your discipline you're in, being a Swiss army knife is really, really important. That's where I think a lot of coaches, and, and this is a kind of part of this kind of being a special teams coordinator is so crucial in your development as a football coach. I know this. I learned more as a special teams coordinator than I did coaching any other position mm. because why? 
you're interacting with every single player in your program. And in most programs, the head coach will be heavily involved in special teams as well. But it forces you to learn, like, go talk to the cornerbacks coach, how he teaches certain techniques. So when you're when you're teaching these guys on, on the punt unit and the punt return unit, go talk to the, you know, release techniques. Go talk to the linebacker coach, how they're teaching tackling. You have to know how the entire program is tackling because you're going to have guys tackling drills. You have guys do this. And you're going to be able to coach all that. And I think that's important for coaches, uh, especially as they grow. I uh, I, I love the analogy, and uh, I would have loved to have seen you in high school algebra and geometry class. <laughs> A's and A's in both, tutor in both as well. So just saying, <laughs> I I got by, I did well. So I know Y equals MX plus B. Way. That's still the still the you know B's that's still that Y intercept, which I still didn't understand why B became the Y intercept, but it is what it is, and it leads to a side angle side postulate. So I'll give you that geometry. You, uh, well. I would say, are are you using your geometry when you're drawing plays up on a whiteboard? <laughs> I, well, you know, it proofs. Think about how important geometry is. Geometry sure. is critical thinking. Algebra Absolutely. is critical thinking. All these things, yes, you are using when you're drawing up plays. You're working at angles on different routes, explaining to a guy when he's coming out of a route to flatten the thing out or, to, you know, instead of giving air, give some air into it, depending on the coverage, the way the guy's playing. These are all things that are important. Guys don't realize when they're sitting there in that class like, man, I got to know about No, no, these are things you need to understand to help you, you know, in the sport. So it's, it's pretty cool. So no, thanks for the, thanks for the heads up on that slam dunk on that, man. The alley -oop there. <laughs> I love it. Hey, before we get to Kerry Combs, uh, I, I forgot to mention Matt Guerrero. There's been so many different things we needed to talk about in this pod. Uh, we didn't even bring up Matt Guerrero's name much. Um, he's an addition to the staff, a, a fairly young guy that uh, comes to Columbus from Duke and somebody that I, I know you're, you know, fairly familiar with. Yeah, Matt's recruited Northeast Ohio for a very long time. I uh, used to bump into Matt and recruiting all the time at different places. You know, and what you love about Matt, Matt's a Willoughby South guy, so he's a Northeast Ohio guy. The Cream Hunts High School, for those of you that aren't as familiar with, like, high schools and things like that. Um, Matt is a guy that came up in the cut system. And I say the cut system because, you know, everyone calls David Cutcliffe cut. Everyone, oh, it's cut. It's cut. It's cut. The thing I love about David Cutcliffe is that he took coaches, became – you know, QCs, analysts, whatever term you want to use, promotes them to graduate assistant, develops them as a graduate assistant. When guys move on from Duke because of money or different opportunities, he would go into that bullpen and he would pull all those guys up, pull those guys up. Cut was really, you know, you look at the Kansas City Royals, the Cleveland Guardians now. The Cleveland, he used his farm system and developed these guys and grew them and molded them into what they are today. You know, Matt started there as a GA, you know, at one point, and then became Ray rose himself up to be the defensive coordinator. It was under Jim Knowles, you know, as an assistant, and then got to understand that. And he's going to be a huge, valuable asset, not only in recruiting uh, for Ohio State, but also technique-wise and the way that Jim teaches, you know, because he's really a disciple of what he's done. And I think he's got enough connections. And that's really where you watch what Ryan Day has done is in these positions, he may not have a guy that's on the field that has a ton of Ohio connections, but he's hiring these Ohio guys to be his head analyst, guys that have recruited the state, guys that know every high school coach of the state or a cell phone or a text away that just add into the amount of people that are hitting them and also helps those coaches when they come back to Ohio State to feel kind of welcome. And it's a, it's a great opportunity for them. So that's where these positions and now these analyst positions are paying, you know, depending where you're at, are paying just as much as if you were working in the MAC or, you know, maybe even the ACC. I mean, different schools that traditionally you would see, you know, they, these guys are having it, but then also they're learning from these other great coaches at Ohio State. So it's a win-win situation for everybody involved. Yeah, he uh, he spent 10 years down at in, uh, in, in Duke. Um, as I understand it, he got his, his uh, graduate degree from Duke. I think he was 2012. He was the GA uh, and kind of rose up through that system. You, know, you you referenced earlier promoting from within and how you know how important that is in a program and how something that that coach Cutcliffe has taken a lot of pride in. I think that's something that Ryan Day has taken a lot of pride in. And I think when when you know opportunities have been warranted, Ryan Day the last few years has given guys within the confines of his own program bigger responsibilities. He's already done it a couple of times this offseason. Uh, and he certainly did it a couple times last offseason with Matt Barnes and Parker Fleming, and he promoted Kerry Combs to be the, the full-time defensive coordinator. Um, so, you know, I, I I admire that about coaches that, you know, they they give opportunities uh, as head coaches, they give opportunities to their assistants to keep growing, um, you know, not just pushing their own careers along and leaving, um, 
you referenced earlier that it's probably the sign of a healthy program. If your coaches are getting plucked, you know, and 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 they've got a job before maybe they've even taken the the nameplate off your door. Um, you you know, as a head coach, you probably don't want your guys to leave. But if others are asking for opportunities to interview your coaches or your guys are getting, you know, chances to look elsewhere for jobs, it probably means that they're doing something really well, you know, within your own walls. So um, thankfully, that's a problem Ohio State's been dealing with for a while because they've had a lot of success and success breeds success. So that's not a huge surprise. Yeah, the best interview is the job you're on at, the, at that point. And sure. so many times it happens. You know, I, I know when, you know, my first opportunity is on the field as a Division One coach, or the quote-unquote on-the-field coaching position, uh, where you're the one going on the road that they're sending recruiting-wise. It happened because why? I did my job in the facility, and somebody saw it every single day and noticed that and said, you know what, I'm bringing that guy with me. I want that guy here uh, to do that. And I think that's where you really see it. I, I know me personally, I lived that life too. I was a graduate assistant at John Carroll. I, mean, I was 24 years I was 24 years old. When I got promoted to be the special teams coordinator, the run game coordinator, the director of football operations, and the offensive line coach and kickers coach, and I think I had tight ends too. But I say all that because, and I was grossly underqualified for all of those. I mean, I remember we went in, we interviewed guys in the process that were older than me, that had more experience. Uh, you know, but Regis Scaife, who I got to give credit to, um, Coach Scaife gave me an opportunity, you know, when a lot of people probably wouldn't have. And when he did giving me that opportunity, it allowed me to kind of grow in the profession, you know, quicker uh, than I, I kind of had assumed. So, and that's some of the, you know, some of the great old time coaches have done, like you said, Ryan Day's doing that by developing guys in his system. And really that's what you hope to do. You hope to look to the bullpen and say, Hey, I can bring this guy up. I can bring this guy up. I can bring this guy up. Um, you know, we're going to be serving the, we're going to be serving the same drink. Um, it's just going to be maybe a different bartender. We uh, will wrap up our conversation this afternoon with Kerry Combs. Um, I don't know if I if I would necessarily frame it like, "Hey, we'll save the best for last." But um, I I have made no you know bones about it publicly. I think extremely highly of Kerry Combs. Um, I appreciate his passion and his energy. I think leadership by example is you know perhaps the most valuable uh, trait that I look for in in coaches that I respect. And I just admire the way he handled his business this year uh, under, you know, some really trying circumstances. Uh, this season certainly didn't go the way that Kerry wanted it to go. He started as the defensive coordinator and he ended it without a job. Um, and he, he went through the season probably in kind of a lame duck session, knowing that, you know, this may not go his way and still, you know, he he stayed committed to the guys that he recruited and to the program that he's worked so hard for. Um, I just have a, a ton of respect and admiration for for him and for the way he's handled himself through all this. Um, and maybe this felt just obvious. Uh, Perry Eliano leaves Cincinnati after coaching the, the Thorpe winner and another great corner. Uh, and he gets hired at Ohio State. And now Kerry, who's looking for work, can go back to his hometown in Cincinnati and work with Luke Fickle and a program that is on the rise and making a move into a power five conference. Um, I, I think it's a great landing spot for him and, and I couldn't be happier for him. Perry, uh, you know, the one thing about Perry, Perry coming to Ohio state, it's a great opportunity for he and his family, but now Kerry, Kerry gets the chance to go back home. You know, a lot of people know his backstory. He was a head coach at Coleraine for a bunch of years and had a great experience there. And then ended up at Cincinnati. His first college coaching job was at Cincinnati. He coaches there, you know, and, and really, I will tell you this, and this is from people I know that were on staff. I've never worked with Kerry. I've known Kerry by bumping into him back and forth. Um, so I've worked on trying to get an autographed picture for Brendan so that he could put right behind him up there on the wall because I <laughs> know this committee for him. Um, it's on another level. Or if anybody has a doll of Kerry or something, if you have a doll of Okay, that's it, weird. <laughs> just put something for him and you can put it on there. But what I say about that is, is he genuinely is loved by the people he's around. He brings an energy that is not uh, that is that is authentic. It's it's genuine. It's who he is every single day. I mean, the guy wears a wristband around at Ohio State that says "juice," and uh, you know that term gets thrown around a lot. But he, and he, I mean, for where he's at his age and everything he does, he is a juice man, and he's going to be a tireless recruiter for for Luke Fickle. He's going to do a good job of working with those corners and, and working with those guys, then being a special teams coordinator, coming back to you know really his roots and getting to having that chance where that adds the value at Cincinnati. He's going to put his hands on every single player in that facility every single day. 
He'll be able to talk to the old linemen about field goal, and he'll be able to talk to the you know the linebackers and the running backs and the tight ends and the wide receiver. He'll talk to everybody, and, and it's going to give him the ability to just positively influence so many kids uh, that he's going to interact with. And I've talked about this before on this on the show. Uh, I remember the first day that Kerry had left Cincinnati to go to Ohio State, and uh, I'm at Moeller High School. I'm standing there, and I'm working at John Carroll University, which, uh, you know, wherever you're working, that's a dream job at that time. And I'm standing there at John Carroll, you know, and I've am got my little shirt and tie on, and I'm like, okay, I'm representing, you know, great school, and walking into Moeller Catholic School, and here comes this little little guy with white hair with an Ohio State coat on. I think still had ta- tags on it from Dix, it looked like, walking in going <laughs> late. Hey man, how about this? I'm coach. I, I was coaching high school ball. I'm coaching at Ohio State, man. He was so excited. He didn't know me from Adam at the time, but for him to be able to do that and to show that, you know, and that that passion and that pride continued to stay with him for such a long period of time. And he's gonna at Cincinnati. I know the guys that were there when when he left because he was still at Brian on Brian Kelly's staff before he got picked up at Ohio State. I remember. Talking to different coaches, they had the banquet there when they took over from Central Michigan to come to Cincinnati. And Kerry was at the banquet with those guys, and they said there was nothing more exciting than every parent, coach, ah, going crazy. He's going to bring that energy. He's going to bring that excitement to Cincinnati um, at, at a program that, uh, you know, Luke does a phenomenal job. These kids love him and love where they're at. But it's just going to be another, you know, great addition for him. And, and the one thing that you have a lot of respect for, Luke Fickle does not hire bums. He does no. not hire bums at Cincinnati, and it just goes to show you again. You know, some people go, "Oh, Ohio State to Cincinnati." Well, Cincinnati had a better year. Cincinnati was in the College Football Playoff. You know, there's a lot to be said, and like you already alluded to, they're going to be in the Big Twelve before you know it, um, and it probably will be a stalwart there as well. Um, you know, because really that conference is going to be up for grabs going forward. I, it's it's going to be the American Conference on steroids, but he really is going to be able to add to that, and I'm really excited for him and his family to really come home. Because the other thing is, people realize Kerry's a grandfather, and his grandkids live in Cincinnati. Right. You know, so they make the trek up to Columbus all the time. They'll go get a chance to see it. His son Brendan was with the, was coaching with the Bengals before, so you know, maybe there's an opportunity for him to go coach at UC. So this will be really, really good, you know, for him and his family. I'll be interested too to uh, see a couple of comments here, you know, to kind of follow the recruiting part of this. Uh, obviously, AJ Harris is a big recruit for the Buckeyes, and um, you know, trying to see if uh, if he'll go with Kerry to Cincinnati or if the Buckeyes could still land him. Uh, we'll keep our eye on that. All right, we'll uh, we'll wrap up our conversation here for the afternoon on that note. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll probably talk to you next week as we assume news will continue to come as it always does, uh, and we'll bring it uh, bring it to you here on Buckeye Breakdown for all the latest uh, with our perspective on what's going on in Columbus. For Tommy Zagorski, I'm Brendan Gulick. Please follow us on social media. We'd really appreciate that. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. If you'd subscribe to that, set your notifications so that you know when we're on. And uh, you can interact with the show live. Thanks for a great audience again here this afternoon. See you real soon. Ohio State football in the middle of winter workouts. We'll have the latest for you coming up here next week. We've got the whole crew together as we cover Ohio State with our instant analysis from Ohio State. There's something that doesn't feel right. Unbelievable effort from him today. Is EJ Liddell going to crack the first team all Big Ten? I think he can be the guy. I'm not trying to start a quarterback controversy. He seems to have the durability. He certainly has the toughness. This is the question on a lot of people's minds here. Welcome to Buckeye Breakdown.